Well, hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to do a tag video. I've kind of fallen behind on tags and I've been tagged in some things, so I wanted to try to get one out of the way. And as I was looking at the tags, the one that jumped out to me immediately was the 10 years, 10 books tag. I was tagged by Leo from A Little Book Life. It was originated by Rick from Another Kick at the Can Lit. I will link both of their videos down below. And I just thought this was a fun, simple tag to do because there are no prompts. You just go through the last 10 years, pick out your 10 favorite books and talk about them. So of course, because I like to make things complicated and I can be a little overly enthusiastic and a bit of a dork or a nerd or whatever you want to call it, I made it a little more complicated. I've also, so I have a giant tower of books next to me um, because I wanted to pick out some of my runners up for each favorite year. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about them because I don't want to detract from the favorites. And the other level that I'm going to add to do my own kind of spin on this is that of the 10 books that were my favorite, I'm gonna pick my ultimate favorite. And I haven't thought about which one is gonna be my favorite because I thought it would be more fun to decide at the end live to kind of force me into making a decision. Maybe it would be a little more interesting that way for you guys and a little more fun for, I don't know if it'll be fun for me, but we'll see how it goes. Actually, it may be what I'll do is as I go through the years, I'll have the favorite from the previous year and that favorite go head to, uh, do a head-to-head -head challenge and then I'll advance one of them and then I'll have a winner at the end. Like I said, I haven't thought this through, so let's, let's try that. We'll see if it works. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> now that we're gonna start with 2010, my favorite book of that year was Call Me By Your Name by Andre Asaman. This is one of my favorite books of all time. I have not read the sequel, by the way, because I've heard, I've heard so many negative things about the sequel. In fact, my husband read the sequel and really hated it. And that was when I really decided to back burner it. I feel like I don't really need, I don't want to tarnish the memory of this book. I also feel like this book doesn't need a sequel. So I'm torn about that. This is also uh, the first book that my husband recommended to me. I met him in January of 2010. And he, on one of our first dates, he mentioned that this was one of his favorite books, because of course I mentioned that I'm a reader. And I read it and it scored him a lot of points. If you're not familiar, you probably are, because not only was a sequel released last year, this was turned into a movie. But if you're not familiar, this is the story of Elio. Elio's family does summers in Italy, and his father always invites a grad student to come with him and help him with his projects. This summer, Elio falls in love with the grad student, and who is a, a, a man named Oliver. And it's about first love, it's about coming out, this was set in the 80s, it's about obsessive desire, uh, and how first love kind of leans into that, and how you can kind of lose yourself in that desire, and until the line between you and the other person blurs. I love it. I think it's a beautiful book. Like I said, it is one of my all-time favorites. I just love this book. Definitely. It, uh, abs without question. My runners-up for the year were also really good books. There's Plague of Doves by Louise Erdrich, which I absolutely love. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize the year that it was published. I think it lost... I can't remember what it lost to. Um, I think it was Olive Kitteridge which I need to reread, but I, I just love A Plague of Doves so much. It's really good. And the other favorite was A Woman in the Dunes, by, The Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe, which I read just before Call Me By Your Name, because at the beginning of 2010, I was on vacation in the Caribbean, and the day I got back, I happened to meet my husband, same day I got back, and then he recommended Call Me By Your Name, and I read it immediately. So this was a very top-heavy year, in case you can't tell, since two of my favorites happened in January and just a generally good year. So, but Call Me By Your Name is absolutely the favorite. Let me move these back there since I have a tower of books to get around. And let's move on to 2011, which was a bit of a weaker year. Obviously, I did not have a booktube channel then, but I have folders on Goodreads for each year in reading, so I went through those. Uh, it was a bit of a weak year in reading. However, there's a clear standout, A Room with a View by E.M. Forster. If you follow this channel at all, you know that Traditionally, I have said that Kurt Vonnegut is my favorite author. He was supplanted by E.M. E. Forster, and this is one of the books that helped aid that transition. By the way, I've been thinking that everything going on in the world right now would be a perfect time to reread Kurt Vonnegut, but I'm also thinking that with everything going on with COVID-19 and politics, that it would be a terrible time to reread Kurt Vonnegut. So what do you think about that? Let me know down below. 
Anyway, <laughs> A Room with a View. So I read Maurice first, and then I read Howard's End, and those are probably my favorite E.M. Forster books, but A Room with a View is definitely up there, and like I said, it is one of the books that helped him transition to become my favorite author. If you're unfamiliar, it's the story of Lucy Honeychurch, who is in Italy, uh, she is British, and she's kind of, it's, it's a love story, but she's caught in between two worlds. Mm -hmm. There are the expectations that people have for her, especially in marriage and what she, what she should do with her life. And then there is this man who intrigues her and is sort of the passionate enticement away from that sort of claustrophobic sense of expectation that she has. It's a beautiful book. Ian Forster writes so well about uh, humanism and connection, and this is a really great example of that. My runner-up for 2011, I only have one, is The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, which was a reread, which shows you that the rest of the year was probably a little bit weak. But And yes, it is a children's book. I don't care what you think. I love this book. It is the one that I gift to people most frequently. So it's my runner-up. Now, let's do the matchup. Call Me By Your Name versus A Room With A View. Which one am I going to advance? I think... Because Call Me By Your Name is one of my all-time favorites, I'm going to advance that. I really do love A Room With A View. I think the story would be very different if we were talking about Maurice or Howard's End. But because it's these two, I'm going to, I'm going to go with Call Me By Your Name. You really can't go wrong with either one. I mean, obviously, because this was still one of my favorite books. But I'm going to go with Call Me By Your Name. So we're going to hold on to this one for the next matchup. Let's go on to 2012, which was... Oh boy, a really good year for reading. And I had a very difficult time choosing my favorite. The way I did is I thought about what I would have said was my favorite in 2012, but also I thought about which book I've reread. And there was only one. This is How You Lose Her by Juno Diaz, which is a book I need to reread. Because um, Juno Diaz has stumbled into some, you know, problematic things. Since this was published, um, a lot of people have rightly accused him of a little bit of misogyny and problematic gender roles in his book. So I need to go back and reread this in the light of all that. However, I remember absolutely loving this book. I actually went to see him do a reading on the day it was released. You can see this is signed. And I, I finished, it's, it's a collection of stories. Uh, if you've read The Brief Wonders Life of Oscar Wilde, Junior shows up in here again. It's a collection of short stories that is very much about immigration and love and what it is to be in a society that does not hear your story or see you, which I think was important for me to read because you know, I'm a white male in America. My story is everywhere. So I remember really loving it. I finished it and then I immediately went back to the first page and read it again. So it's the only book of my favorites from 2012 that I reread. And that is why I chose it as my favorite. Now, why was it so hard to choose? Well, my runner-up <laughs> is Bring Up the Bodies by Hilary Mantel and another one. And I really love this book. I don't think I need to talk about this because with everything going on, you know, the conclusion of this trilogy just came out. I, you all know it. Um, like I said, the only thing that really decided it was that I have actually reread This Is How You Lose Her and I have not reread Bring Up the Bodies. My other favorite from the year was Half Blood Blues by Essie Adujan, which is a book that I don't think a whole lot of people know about and I feel like they should discover. I like this a lot more than Washington Black and I think it's great. Okay, This Is How You Lose Her versus Call Me By Your Name. I think I'm gonna go the same route I did the last time because Call Me By Your Name is one of my all-time favorite books and I need to reread This Is How You Lose Her. As, uh, even if I had read it recently, I think I would probably go with this one because it's one of my favorites. So that's how it's going to go. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be funny if Call Me By Your Name just runs all the way to the finale and ends up winning? We'll see what happens. Okay, 2013 was actually a really, really, really weak year for reading. Admittedly, I did not read too many books in 2013. And thankfully, there was a clear standout, one that I think probably would have been my favorite, even if I had read a whole lot of books. It's Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. That is what the cover actually looks like. I have an advanced copy of it. I really love this book. It's about cultural displacement and immigration, and it's a love story. It's about a woman who grows up in Africa and immigrates to the United States, and it's about the love story with a man uh, who I believe stays back in Africa. It's very smart, very sharp. I really enjoyed this book a lot. I have heard that there is going to be an adaptation at some point with Lupita Nyong'o playing the main character. I would love to see that. I, I have never seen it materialize. 
I don't even know what the status of it is. The last time I heard, I thought they were thinking of making it into a limited series instead of a movie. Neither here nor there, but yeah, def definitely my favorite book of 2013. My runner-up would be uh, Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe, which would probably be the only other book I read in 2013 that I liked. And happens to, it's a book I really did enjoy. I don't have a copy of it that I can show you because I have an ebook. I, I do think Americana is worth a favorite spot anyway. It's, it's just the only bright spot in a really weak year of reading, which was 2013. Now. Americana versus Call Me By Your Name. And I think I'm going to do the same thing because this is one of my favorite books. As much as I love Americana, and I think if you haven't read it, you should, um, I, I, I'm going with Call Me By Your Name. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. 2014 was a much better year of reading. My favorite book was uh, The Good Lord Bird by James McBride. Funny story for you, I, when this came out, I went into a Barnes & Noble and I asked them, do you have The Good Lord Bird? And the person looked at me like I was insane. Typed in the computer, came back to me and was like, no, we don't have that. Uh, who's the author? And eventually I found out that they thought I had said Gerd Loebd. So I corrected them and said, no, 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 no. The Good Lord Bird. And they looked at me and they said, well, is that a business book? And I said, oh, no, it, it, it's a novel. And they looked it up and they said, well, we don't have that. It's, it's The Good Low Bid. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's The Good Lord Bird by James McBride, winner of the National Book Award. I think the New York Times had even named it one of its favorite books of the year at that point. They didn't have it in stock. And I happened to be in an independent bookstore later that same week. And I walked in and they immediately asked me, do you need help finding anything? And I said, offhand, do you have the good Lord Bird? And the person said, that is a really great book. Let me show you where it is. We, we definitely have it. And I bought it right away because I was interested in reading it. I had been thinking I wanted to look at it, but I bought it as a kind of reward that they actually knew what I was talking about and didn't think that... I had asked for a book called Gerd Loeb. Oh, the worst part of it was when we finally got, when I, they finally got the title, The Good, the Good Lord Bird at Barnes and Noble, they looked at me and, and said, well, that's a weird title. And I was thinking, weirder than Gerd Loeb? <laughs> Which is not, by the way, this is not a knock on Barnes and Noble. I, I love Barnes and Noble, but uh, it is part of the reason why I tend to love independent bookstores more and why I love, tend to love the people who work in independent bookstores more. Anyway, The Good Lord Bird is a really great book. Uh, it was my favorite book of the year. It's, I'm going to keep saying this is, it's a really great book, but you know, just bear with me. So this follows a, sli a young boy who's kind of in the 10, 10 11, 12 uh, age range. He disguises himself as a girl in order to survive a raid. He, uh, he is a slave and ends up in the traveling around with John Brown, the real life abolitionist, in the lead up to the raid on Harper's Ferry. It is a story that is very much about how your identity is stolen from you because of slavery or because of racism, and it, but it's also very funny. It has a lot of other really weighty themes, but it's very funny, very sharp. I would absolutely recommend it uh, to you. I'd recommend all of these books, but yeah, this is one that I would really recommend you get to. My runners up for this year, A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozeki and The People in the Trees by Hanya Yanagihara, which is funny because I absolutely hated A Little Life, which was Hanya Yanagihara's second book. Apologies to all the people on BookTube who love that book, including Leo, who tagged me to do this video in the first place. But there you go, I did love this one. <laughs> so, all right, let's do the matchup. The Good Lord Bird, not Ger Gerd Loebd, versus Call Me By Your Name, and I think I'm gonna do the same thing. This is one of my favorite books, so it's gonna, it is gonna be hard to beat. And I'm sorry to see The Good Lord Bird go, but it is what it is. All right, 2015, here comes a great book. All My Puny Sorrows, uh, the, the cover is mostly white and the light doesn't like it, so I wanna hope, I, I, it looks like you can see it now, and I want you to because this is a really beautiful cover, I love it very much. So uh, this book is loosely inspired by real life events uh, in the life of Miriam Taves. She, it, it, the, the, the sisters at the center of the story have a very similar upbringing to Miriam Taves. And Miriam Taves has a sister who, or had a sister who was a concert, concert pianist who committed suicide. The premise of this book is that a girl with a very similar upbringing to Miriam Taves has a sister who is a world famous concert pianist who attempts suicide and she is on suicide watch and she asks her sister if she will help her die. And it's about sisterhood and the deep bonds of it. It's about family uh, and it's about how difficult it is when you want to help someone who just doesn't want your help. It's a very serious book. 
it made me cry, which is not a lot of books have done, but it also is a very funny book and a very heartfelt book. So I absolutely recommend it. I wouldn't let the subject matter scare you away. It made me laugh out loud, which not a lot of books have done. I might find a book amusing, but actual laughter does not happen a lot. And this did it along with the tears. So I really love this book a lot. My runners up for 2015 were the Pulitzer Prize winner for that year, All the Light We Cannot See and Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe by Fanny Flagg, which I read because I loved the movie and I loved the book every bit as much as the movie. It was really good. So those are my runners up. Okay, this, is, this one is hard. I think I'm gonna do the same thing I did in all the previous rounds and because this is one of my all-time favorites. I'm gonna go with that. But if you haven't read All My Puny Sorrows, please read All My Puny Sorrows. It is so good. 2016, I don't own copies of the book that was my favorite or the runners up, so, uh, uh, but my favorite book was Homegoing by Yag Gyasi. I've heard, seen some people criticize this book because of the structure, but the structure is honestly one of the things that I love the most. So in the beginning of the book, there are two sisters living in Ghana uh, during the slavery era before the Civil War. One of them is captured and sent across the ocean to the United States and sold into slavery. The other one stays back in Ghana. Every chapter of the book jumps ahead a generation, following the descendants of, alternating back and forth between the descendants of the sister who is in the United States and the sister who stays in Ghana. The criticism I've heard is that because you always jump ahead, there is no character who it serves as a through line. A character might have aged into the point of being like a grandmother or a grandfather in the next time we loop back around to them, but there really isn't any character who's a through line. To me that was the point, and I think what this book does really well is it shows the long-lasting impact of the slave trade, both on the United States and in Africa, but also on the people who lived it and the families and what it does over time. I think it's just such a good book, such a smart book, I really loved it, and I mean obviously it was my favorite for the year. So I recommend you check it out because I don't, I, I, there are some people on BookTube who have sung, it, sung its praises, but I think it is a book that deserves to be discovered a bit more. My runners up were The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, which I think everybody on BookTube probably knows about, and The Turner House by Angela Flournoy, which I apparently have difficulty saying, which is another really beautiful story. So three books all about race in America <laughs> in 2016, uh, but Homegoing would definitely be my favorite. Now, Homegoing versus Call Me By Your Name. I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to stick with Call Me By Your Name, although I do think Homegoing is a book that more people need to discover. Now we get to 2017. My favorite book was The Heart's Invisible Furies by John Boyne. This is a really beautiful book. Uh, it is about a man who is born in Ireland uh, in the mid-1900s and uh, it follows his life. It jumps ahead every seven, seven years uh, periodically and kind of checks in with where he is at that point. And it, his life follows Ireland's transition from an extremely, extremely, extremely Catholic country to a bit more of a liberal country that is a little bit more accepting of say, gay people. And it's about his own journey toward acceptance and love. Uh, he is adopted by... His adopted mother is like a character out of Roald Dahl and Charles Dickens. And I, I love her. I, it's a really great book. It's also a very funny book. Uh, I knew from the first chapter that I was going to love this book. And I've had mixed... I've only read one other John Boyne book and I hated it. So I don't know if this is like a one shot. But yeah, I did love The Heart's Invisible Furies. I was really tempted to go with one of my runners up as my favorite book of this year. But this is the one that I actually called my favorite. And I did really love it. But my runners up were Angle of Repose which by Wallace Stegner, and I really loved that book. I think it's really good. It's very much about history and how difficult it is to understand where you come from it, and a lot of other things. It's so good. And A Manual for Cleaning Women by Lucia Berlin, which is a collection of short stories and just really incredible writing in here. But I'm going to stick with The Heart's Invisible Furies now in the head-to-head, -head, two LGBTQ books facing each other, uh, and I'm sticking with Call Me By Your Name. Yeah. So, it's still going strong. 2018, 
my very first video on booktube i believe was my favorite I, it was at the very end of 2018 in, in december and i did my favorite books and of the year and my favorite was the great believer still is i don't think it's a perfect book but I, overall it just really added up to something that really really got me i love it very much so it's the story of aids in chicago in the 1980s there's also a, a modern uh or close to modern element as well and it really shows the ripple effects of grief over time love it it's a really really good book my runners up were uh actually my runners up in the video were different from the runners up that i'm going to say now my runner up was they're there by tommy orange and Call Me By Your Name, which I reread. But I, with the benefit of hindsight, I'm going to give my runner-up status to The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton, which I absolutely love and I need to read more Edith Wharton, uh, and Evicted by Matthew Desmond, which is a nonfiction book, and this is the only time a nonfiction book will appear on this list, which I think is disappointing because I love nonfiction. Now, The Great Believers versus Call Me By Your Name. I do think there are some flaws in The Great Believers, like I said. I think it's a great book, but not a perfect book. And this is one of my favorites, so I'm sticking with that. Only one more year to go. <laughs> Can anything stop? Call me by your name. We'll see. All right, we get to last year. If you followed along, you probably already know my favorite book from last year was A Place for Us by Fatima Farheen Mirza. Such a good book. Such a good book. So this is the story of a Muslim family living in America, and the event that sets, in, that sets everything in motion is that an estranged brother is invited to his sister's wedding. He has not seen his family in a, a, a certain amount of, maybe two years, maybe longer, I, can't, I don't remember. And the story moves back in time, back and forth in time to show the story of them as children and the, the way they are now in the present. And what I think is so beautiful is that the characters are so sharply drawn and there's so, there are so many interesting levels about this book. One of the great joys of booktube for me has been watching people read this book and see what they react to about it. I feel like anybody who loves this book has something else that they would say is their favorite element of it and nobody's wrong. And it's just, it's so fascinating. Um, it also deals with religion and expectation and gender roles. For instance, one of the sisters is, as the eldest, she has to decide at what point she is going to cover herself for religious purposes and if she is going to. And it, everything about it is so interesting. And what I think is really sharp about what Fatima Farheen Mirza does, and this is a debut novel, by the way, is that Fatima Farheen Mirza really understands that families are complicated and that nobody can, sometimes there are different sides to a story. You frequently see the same event told a couple of different ways and not in a repetitive way, it's interesting. But she understands that usually there isn't one inciting moment that somebody will make somebody say, well, that's it, I'm, out. I'm leaving, I'm not talking to you anymore. There are usually a series of smaller things over time that create tiny cracks. And of course, tiny cracks get bigger over time. They combine together and create a giant, giant fracture that just tears the whole thing apart. And she does that in such a beautiful way. She shows all of those little things that happen over time. Uh, there is, of course, an inciting incident that kind of becomes the last straw, but there's such a foundation for everything that happens and everything makes sense. Everything is flawless. It's such a good book. Uh, such a good book. Any other year, my runner-up easily would have been my favorite book. Uh, my runner-up was A Fine Balance by Rahinton Mystery. Any other year, this would have been my favorite uh, read of the year. It just happened to be against A Place for Us, which I really, really love, if, in case you can't tell. It's so good. Now, the difficulty here is that I read A Place for Us about a year ago, so it's still very fresh in my mind. By the way, the part of it that I remember that hit me the hardest was, I don't want to, and I don't want to say too much about it because it does involve the last part of the book, uh, but throughout the book, the father of the family does not speak. You, you kind of rotate around the rest of the family members, and then finally, in the end, you hear from the father. And it is, it's beautiful. It just, it's just beautiful. And it resonated with me very hard because it's about expectation and good intentions and how sometimes because you have good intentions for someone, you end up pushing them away. 
And as a foster father who has been struggling with that for two years, two and a half years, and you know, I don't want to get into it too much here, but you know, my foster son is about to graduate and has made it clear he wants to go off and do his own thing. I don't want to get into that too much, but I hope that gives you enough to understand why I love this book so much. And I only read it a year ago and I'm still in the middle of all those feelings. So it's really hard for me to judge. <laughs> you know, I read Call Me By Your Name 10 years ago. It has stood the test of time. I know, and I reread it. I know that I love it. I read this a year ago. I have not reread it, but I've been thinking about it so much in the last year. So it's hard because this is the newer one. It's the more relevant one for me right now. And this is the one I've traditionally loved. So it's hard to say, will a place for us stand the test of time? Is it something that I will be talking about in 10 years as much as I talk about it right now? I'm gonna say A Place For Us is my favorite book from the last decade, which is not what I was expecting as I was going through. I really did, at a certain point, think that Call Me By Your Name was going to have a clean run to the end. But as I've been talking about it, especially as I talked about why it's still relevant to me, um, yeah, uh, I'm going with A Place For Us by Fatima Fahim Mirza. That's my favorite book from the last 10 years. And that is the 10 years, 10 books tag. I got myself emotional. <laughs> so uh, I'm just gonna laugh it off and keep going. So yeah, uh, if you've read this or if you've read any of the others, if you have contrary opinions or uh, you know, uh, uh, agreeing opinions, I would love to hear that. I would love to hear what your favorite book of the last 10 years is. Um, and if you have your own opinions on what your 10 books 10 years would be, I'm not gonna tag anybody. It's my usual cop out. If you're watching this video and you wanna do it, I recommend it. It's fun to go through memory lane. And I know I, I made it more complicated by including the runners up and adding a sort of contest element to see what the number one book of the last 10 years was. But I think it was a really, uh, for me, there was a, a big emotional payoff. Uh, I really do think A Place For Us is going to be something that I will love throughout my whole life. So there you go. That's the 10 years, 10 books tag. Uh, I'm gonna get going <laughs> so I can have, a, have myself a moment. Uh, anyway, thank you for following along, for watching this video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.